you know, being able to basically interrogate and have a conversation with your infrastructure is, is a pretty interesting, you know, pretty interesting space to be in, right? Have you talked to batteries before, Albert? <laughs> I'm sure you've tested it out. Yeah, I won't go quite that far, but, um, but uh, we're right on the edge of that, you know. What does AI really mean for clean energy? These days, the answer is increasingly hard to find. The AI craze fueled by the popularization of tools like ChatGPT has produced a frothy layer of contenders and pretenders. But under it all are applications that could have a big impact on the energy transition. And we need all the help we can get. I'm John Ingle, Editor-in-Chief of Renewable Energy World. To make sense of what's what, I'm joined this week by Albert Hofeld, the Senior Vice President of Technology for solar and battery storage software provider STEM. Hofeld has spent a career analyzing and developing AI tools, and he'll show us how to separate meaningful tech from marketing hype. He also shares why STEM thinks you should be able to talk to and with your projects and what they're building to make it a possibility very soon. That's all next on Factor This from Renewable Energy World. Albert Holfeld, thanks so much for joining the Factor This podcast. It's great to see you. John, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So ever since the, you know, all the craze around chat GPT and all these other AI language models first started, I guess a few months ago now, it seems like it's all happened very quickly. Mm. I've been wanting to tackle this topic of AI and machine learning and clean energy, but had a difficult time, one, identifying the tangible applications for the industry beyond the hype and the boilerplates on websites and every company seeming seemingly being involved now in AI and then separating those serious players from, you know, the hordes of companies now that exist saying that they're in the space. So given your your background here, I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, breaking that down piece by piece and, and seeing where you think this industry is going, because I think it's an exciting space, especially around battery storage, solar and, and the like. Is that a fair representation of the kind of hmm. situation we're in? I'll start there before going much further. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it is relatively fair. Um, it is, there's quite a bit of hype, um, you know, in this whole cycle, but uh, I think we've embraced it, um, you, you know, relatively well and the company has been founded on it. But um, I think before I get into kind of the details of that, maybe we'll give you a little background in terms of, um, you know, the company myself. Yeah, please do. And then we'll get into kind of the AI space. Um, so, um, so I've been at STEM for about um, a year and a half. And um, prior to STEM, you know, I've, I was in energy and also trading. Um, I was a CTO at uh, Liquid X and also Genscape. And then uh, prior to that, um, in trading and uh, trading systems at Thomson Reuters and, and then in consulting before that. Anyway, so, um, you know, what's, what's very exciting about the, the space that we're in is, um, you know, the connectivity solutions around IoT and all the device management that we have and the sensors that are out there. Um, you know, that we have um, basically managing and monitoring, you know, so much infrastructure that is in this renewable space. And of course, STEM is a company that um, is totally focused on renewables and our Athena platform, right, that that Athena platform is intended to then manage, you know, all of that infrastructure. Um, so we have the combination of storage and solar assets that um, that our system manages. Um, and, and we'll get into a bit more on, on this, but, um, you know, the essence is really around the optimization of, of how um, we monitor solar and manage um, the infrastructure around batteries and for charge and discharge and balance these things out um, in addition to what we can do with, um, with the trading of those assets or trading of power. Right. So we, we also have solutions that uh, that support customers who want to get into power trading, which is great um, because it's then that balance between all of those. And that balance between all those is really comes down to um, a, a data science, um, machine learning and optimization problem. Um, and so this leads us down the path of, of course, you know, the, the history of, of the company, which really was founded in, in um, AI slash data science. Um, you know, over a decade ago. And so we've been, been, you know, managing, monitoring and optimizing systems, you know, based on analytics and all of those kind of, um, you know, the characteristics that drive, you know, optimization, which, I, like I said, we'll talk about that more, um, you know, of, of system management. But now um, into the space really of, of chat GPT and, and AI for, for those purposes, large language models and so on. Um, and so we've, you know, uh, of course, you know, been involved in that as well. And we've built out um, basically our own um, Athena bot, as, 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 as it were. And, um, you know, this goes to, you know, many different ways, 
you know, that, that AI is being leveraged, um, you know, from the optimization side of things, um, you know, to something as friendly as what is, you know, um, an Athena, you know, chatbot. Um, and so when you think about then, you know, the, you know, large language models and, and where chat GPT is, um, you know, it really adds a completely new channel of, of interface in terms of how customers can interact with your products. Um, the underlying analytics around all of this is, is really where all the, the secret sauce is, right? And so that goes to the point around, um, you know, what we try to do with, um, let's say, our, our digital twin modeling, right, where we say, you know, we have infrastructure that we've been managing for all those years. We have, um, you know, millions of, of runtime hours um, of those systems. And then how the models are used uh, to predict where we may see, you know, different types of events. The events can be um, around optimization, right, in a trading opportunity, or it can be around um, a digital twin or digital model where we think that there might be a maintenance um, event required, right? And so we can do things like improve reliability, you know, based on what we've done in capturing and instrumenting our entire um, infrastructure out into the edge, right? Out into the physical environment, pulling all that data in, analyzing that data and using it for a whole myriad of different purposes. Um, some of those purposes are around, you know, the training data sets and the training data sets can be around optimization or the training data sets can be around what would be used for that chat GPT or Athena bot type functionality. So, um, you know, if we think about how a customer, you know, may typically in, in the past have interacted with customer support um, or, or if they've used their applications to kind of run diagnostics on their own, right, that now they can actually appeal to what would be the much more friendly interface of, of an Athena bot. And so they can ask questions to it about how, how do I, um, you know, get additional levels of optimization, you know, out of my physical infrastructure, out of my, um, you know, could be um, the solar assets or the storage assets. And so based on, you know, that customer's information, as well as then all the data that's been captured previously, right, we're able to then leverage all of those training sets and real world data to provide a customer with a very friendly, you know, series of recommendations or answers in, in that kind of natural language, um, friendly Athena bot type interface um, that doesn't require sleuthing through many facts and and um, kind of um, interrogating, you know, mountains of kind of historical data, but rather gives you that synthesized uh, pre-canned set of, um, you know, of responses, you know, based on those, those data sets. Um, so that's, that's a lot, that, you know, kind of that I just threw at you in terms of just the, the history of the company, the, you know, the application space and what we're doing with, um, you know, ChatGPT and any kind of thing that you'd like me to unpack a little more. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe using the evolution of STEM would be a good way of outlining where this market started and where it's going. You mentioned the the foundation of AI and data. Where where did all this start? And I, you gave us a bit of the where we are now, but like, what's the broader opportunity here? Instead of just again labeling things as AI and machine learning, like what's what's the big you know golden goose here? It's interesting because you know, the way that, um, you know, our first interpretation of, of, you know, our challenge, you know, was, was how we optimize um, storage systems for customers, right? And so that charge discharge activity, what goes into that, um, you know, is, is everything from, um, you know, pricing data of power to, um, you know, behavior of the battery systems to the weather to, you know, the demand side in terms of, you know, what a customer is using that infrastructure for those battery systems for, are they running, you know, the warehouse power plant, um, you know, other things, right? So, um, you know, there's a whole variety of different kinds of characteristics that are relatively complex. And so when the company started, it was, it was very much, um, you know, working towards something which was autonomous, right? And it was a bit of a black box because customers, you know, really wanted um, a turnkey solution. Uh, and so we offered that, right? And so, you know, like I said, we've been we've been capturing data and optimizing, you know, for well over a decade. And we have an enormous amount of data that then provides customers with what are then those kind of recommendations and decision points and the systems can um, can run um, autonomously. So what we find though is, is that um, customers now are evolving to the point where they want more insight. Uh, they want to dabble with um, some of the knobs and dials uh, a bit more on their own. They want to get uh, more into, uh, you know, power trading. They want to expand, you know, their asset pool 
um, in terms of um, going just more from where they were, maybe just storage to now solar and storage. And then also, of course, um, you know, we did an acquisition of, of also energy you know, last year, and, and that's a solar monitoring platform. And so now those solar organizations, um, you know, are also thinking about then adding storage on where they haven't. And so we've got this great combination um, of solar and storage together. And we have customers who are very excited about, you know, this combination and getting further into the interactivity with the platform. And so, you know, what that means is that tools that we had built out over the years uh, you know, that, that our own operations teams would use that would, you know, look at all types of behaviors of the systems and look for alerts and events and so on. Um, you know, and there's a whole managed service behind all of this. There's, there's humans in the loop um, because of what we're dealing with with powering the grid. Um, you know, and so now customers would like access to those tools. So we are exposing uh, more of those tools that give um, detailed granular visibility into the behavior patterns of the battery systems um, and the solar systems and, and combining them into one platform and then allowing them to have more um, kind of self-configurability if, if, if they would like. And then also, you know, that's, that's in that cloud application, right? So bringing all this into one application that allows and um, empowers users to, to get into the nitty gritty. And, and this goes to how they're gonna optimize their assets, right? So the financial return of those assets, um, you know, is, is, is a great opportunity, um, optimizing how they're consuming and, and discharging um, the batteries, and then looking at how that can be used uh, for trading, right, power trading. So there's many different kind of facets to this. Of course, renewables as an overall is is really, uh, you know, what the huge change agent is. And so we were we were early on in that in that kind of endeavor, and that's where customers are very excited about it now. Of course, right, climate change, et cetera, and what the overall initiative is about, and then how we further optimize um, what is a you know a great opportunity to improve the kind of the the global ecosystem is also how to then financially optimize the investments that companies have made on uh, on those batteries and, and solar systems. So the big kind of, you know, so what of where we're going really is is further optimization of uh, and, and growth, right, of, of the types of systems that are bringing renewables into the market at an exponential rate. And so, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, many organizations that are that are leveraging what we've got to power warehouses, manufacturing facilities, you know, their their office buildings, et cetera. And they can they optimize that charge, you know, based on when power is cheap or or solar, et cetera. So um, you know, that's where I think there's huge opportunity. We're also powering, of course, you know, the EV landscape too, right? So we have offerings there. And as you've seen, right, the, the, the additional load on the grid from EV is another third on top of, you know, the already kind of uh, heavily taxed system that's designed, you know, as it has been for corporate, industrial, and residential, right? EV is a whole other third on top of that. And so, um, you know, the, uh, the solutions that we've got uh, that we're rolling out with, um, you know, EV-oriented fleets, um, you know, it's also a great opportunity for us. Well, and there's a lot of opportunity on the grid software side too, and the, the management of power flow and, and how all of this just comes together at a, at a macro scale, but just mm -hmm. focusing more on the assets themselves, because that's kind of the, the focus of, of this podcast. You, you mentioned a couple of things that I want to unpack a bit. So you started out as this black box turnkey solution for the customer to eliminate the need to be turning the dials. Mm -hmm. And now we have people who want to be more involved in the mix. Um, yes. In, in my thinking, the whole promise of AI and machine learning is to eliminate the need for turning the dials. Is it yes. not? Is it? So yeah. what's that kind of uh, that balance there where people want to be more involved, but, you know, the I think the end goal should be have something spit out. What is my best opportunity for return and optimizing the asset and, mm -hmm. and longevity and all these things? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the thing is, is that um, you know what what you see is customers that that want additional visibility and 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 to be empowered to make some of these decisions, right? They they like to receive the recommendations, and they still want to um, just be more involved, right? So, um, to your point, the recommendations that we'll make, you know, are based on enormous amounts of of data, right? And so, the data that we you know that we use to optimize these models is far greater than what um, you know, customers are, are, are you know, running any analytics with, right? So the recommendations that we'll make are anything from, you know, trading events to, you know, system charge, discharge, 
um, you know, to how uh, configurations, you know, may be further optimized. And so, um, you know, customers are, I think, becoming much more educated and they, they are more interested in, in, in getting involved in the care and feeding of those assets. And so as they're making additional investments, right, they feel, you know, that they've gone from, hey, let's, let's um, you know, let's work with this, let's understand it, let's see how it performs. And, and they're, they, I think, have a great appreciation for how those assets are performing. And now they want to make even larger investments. And so as they're making larger investments, they're becoming more educated, they have staff, you know, that are interested in being more involved. And um, and you also have a broader range of asset types that they might be, um, you know, investigating. So they might be getting into wind um, and, and other types. Right. So, uh, you know, we're we're um, exploring all these other kind of assets as well. Right. But, um, you know, but at the moment, you know, they still want to be um, you know, more involved. They'll take those recommendations that are based on ML and AI, which are, I think, um, as, as we'll be publishing in upcoming um, articles, you see that we have a great competitive advantage, you know, other, over others in the in the field, um, in the market, and so then uh, they'll they'll take our recommendations, you know, assess those, see what past performance have, has delivered to them based on what our recommendations have been, and then they'll, they'll make those decisions going forward. But they just like to see and I think feel and and take um, a, a greater level of of involvement in in looking and managing their assets. Well, I would imagine too, though, for those uh, energy battery storage developers who are wading further and further into merchant markets, um, that we, we've seen that kind of trend, that there would be an advantage of a set it and forget it kind of solution where you are handling or that the AI is handling all power trading. And that is not yeah. something that they have to worry about as yeah. finance pros or as developers or asset mm -hmm. owners or whoever, like that's not their core competency. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's where, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, there are many markets that are kind of similar to this where where customers need to, you know, become familiar. They need to see the results and they need to, um, you know, kind of uh, be around the exhaust of the trades. And uh, it's like this in, in trade finance and, in, and obviously in, in kind of the renewable space. But once they they, you know, become comfortable and they have the confidence and they see the results, right? Then they're getting more and more likely to do that, set it and forget it and rely on then, you know, the system and the automation, um, you know, which is exactly where we're going. And so, um, you know, places places where um, they might want to dabble a bit, you know, is kind of even, you know, kind of what if planning, right? So if they were to then, you know, make additional investments in infrastructure, what what might their returns look like? And so we have modeling tools, which allow them, um, you know, to see what those those return on investments would look like and um, different places that they might, um, you know, want to make investments in different, you know, geographical areas. And so they can do all this modeling and 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 understand you know where they might go next, right? So it's it's a combination of of um, feeling what they've got and being involved in that, and then also looking at where they might expand um, in the future, in maybe in the current geography, maybe in other plants or or locations that they want to deploy. And so we have tools that that manage and and offer all those kinds of analytics as well. We've talked a little bit about the the market functions, and and that makes clear sense to me. I think just following price signals and and adjusting in real time. Um, how about the O&M piece? You mentioned the bundling of the data with the digital twin of the actual asset. Mm -hmm. How does, what's the role of AI and machine learning in, um, yeah. you know, long-term performance and spotting, you know, inefficiencies or issues at the cell level or the power electronics? Yeah. How does mm -hmm. that all mix in and, and forecasting not only for what you can expect over the lifetime of the asset, but the, the real-time impact? Yes, yeah, it's, it's really exciting, actually. Um, you know, this space is something which, uh, you know, is is um, you know is always under kind of um, you know investment and and analysis and R and D in terms of um, you know which infrastructure and what characteristics are the most relevant, um, and it and it goes into um, a good relationship between you know, providers like us and manufacturers and understanding their infrastructure, their hardware, um, you know, having the kind of API integration between uh, the systems, because there's always different levels of information which are exposed to us. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the part which is very exciting is bringing together what is the combination of that instrumented data that is captured from the infrastructure and then the behavior of the systems 
and then the interaction between then you know our engineering teams and customer and looking at this at the infrastructure level right so diagnosing um you know battery system characteristics um the charge systems um inverters etc you know and then also looking at um you know what happens when we have um you know data oriented issues right so data hygiene is also part of this um you know so um, you look for anomaly detection and, and just different characteristics in the behavior of the data um what happens in the transmission, et cetera. So there's many different characteristics which we look at. And, and what happens is, is our team works closely with you know, the field ops folks to say, okay, so we, we've seen these various data events. We, we understand what the behavior and the resulting system issues are. Now, the root cause analysis it turns out to be, let's say, X, Y, Z, right? And so it's it's the root cause analysis that is that human engineering aspect of understanding what is that very complex array of, of infrastructure and storing that in a repository and then um, feeding that into, you know, AI-based systems that allow for, um, you know, very descriptive um, events. So it could be, it could be um, you know, customers, or field engineers describing the characteristics of what they're seeing, you know, at the hardware level, you know, you know, temperature, other behavioral patterns, right? And then what they're seeing at the data level, and and then an end-to-end -end solution of of all the characteristics together, and and then coming up with then what the system thinks may be the core issue or issues, right? To look at, and so um, so some of these things are are meant for um, use in situation. Right, right at the time of, of an event. Um, but ideally we use these to, to forecast and prevent any types of issues, right? So we, we look at all those behaviors which went into an outage or um, an underlying piece of infrastructure that had an issue. And then we look at all the data that leads up to that, right? And so then we try to then um, on, on a you know ongoing basis kind of run signal analytics on all that, that information that we're gathering and start to identify when we think there may be an event could be 30 days into the future. It could be then next day, right? So depending on the nature of the system issues um, and the data that we're seeing, right, we can then forecast and say, hey, we're gonna have um, a maintenance event that we need to um, undertake and make a recommendation to a customer, or it could be the tweak of a configuration. Well, the solution is obviously to benefit the solar or battery asset owner themselves in in optimizing and sustaining the, the actual asset. But I, I see that, you as STEM being able to aggregate all of this data from all of your partners, that becomes a pretty valuable data set. Do you own that data that you collect and optimize for each of your partners and are then able to kind of bundle that and, and learn from each of those assets for future customers? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so we do. Yeah, we do own that data. Um, and of course, customers are able to, to you know, to leverage and consume the data and use it for whatever analytics that they they like as well, right? Because we're collecting it from, you know, from the systems. Um, and so uh, uh, we do run, you know, a whole myriad of analytics on that data. That That is a mountain of data that um, we think is relatively differentiated, um, you know, and so when, when you know, new organizations uh, pop up that are even in our space or, or customers, right, and they start to capture data, you know, it's just uh, it's it's a thimbleful compared to what we've got is an ocean of data where um, you know the 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 data is, is relevant itself. But again, marrying it up with what our root cause and our assessment, our views, and looking at result sets of of you know everything from you know you know battery system behavior to you know trade results, et cetera, is fantastic. Um, the thing which you know I think is interesting as well, right, is when we think about um, you know, what might be unique to a specific customer. And so when we think about, um, you know, training, you know, of behavior patterns, we're going to get to a point where customers are going to ask for, you know, their own siloed um, kind of uniquely um, configured data set where they will want to silo that off, right? They might see that as secret sauce, right? And so it could be anything from, you know, data analytics that they're running, um, you know, if they if they want to download and look at data of a certain type, a certain nature, if they want to, you know, kind of use toolbox, um, you know, analytics, because we offer those, you know, within our environment, you know, they want to run their own. Um, but having that kind of walled off, you know, in an area which then um, they, they can say, we actually don't want to share, you know, any of the type of analytics or any of the behavior patterns, et cetera, that then, you know, that they'll be able to do that. And I think the same thing will go in terms of, uh, 
um, you know, learning models and AI, right, in terms of um, having features, you know, that are unique to customers and how certain features are evolved more and enriched more with the training data or the, the real world data that then they've got or they would be contributing, you know, they can potentially hold off on certain aspects of it, or they can have a subset of a model or a feature set that are trained uniquely to their configuration and say, hey, I'd, I'd like to hold on to what I think is some unique training, which I'm actually giving to the system. And I'd like to actually contain that and have it be just, just mine or, you know, just a subset. Right. So I think that that's another place where we're going in terms of compartmentalizing and segmenting off intellectual property, which could be then specific to a customer and what would otherwise potentially go into, um, you know, benefiting the whole. Right. So you have kind of a, you know, a mix and match of these things because customers also realize that the more that they feed and, and they can feed anonymized um, data, right, that they benefit from that as well. So it's a balancing act between what they might consider to be unique for them and then what's um, you know, what they benefit from as a whole by then receiving similar types of, of um, you know, recovery events or, or configuration data that they get the benefit of from other com com companies or customers contributing as well. What's been the biggest challenge in building all this out? Because obviously, you know, you've got the history in this space even before STEM, um, the language model, integrating all this data, have there been hangups along the way as, as you're really trying to scale to meet this moment where, you know, it's obviously kind of the hottest thing in, in, in yeah. tech, in climate tech. I mean, there's, yeah. there's gotta be something. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, um, you know, it, it's interesting because probably the most challenging aspect of what, what we've pulled together, you know, is really um, dealing with what would be, um, you know, data inconsistency or data differences or hardware differences, um, looking across the history of all the different device types and drivers and, and firmware variations and, um, you know, operating system variants, et cetera, and trying to then ensure that we're always dealing with, you know, apples to apples comparisons, right? And so the normalization of that data, you know, and master data management, um, and infrastructure management around that, right? With that whole legacy of, uh, as you can imagine, right? 10 to 15 years of legacy devices and, and how time, you know, has changed and all those, those kind of hardware devices have changed and, and the myriad of different third parties. Um, so managing that, you know, is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, but where we're, you know, where we're going is um, a place where we have um, more of a plug and play model anyway, right? So that, what we're going to be doing is offering kind of a, you know, a FINA certified, um, you know, devices and, and, and well, not devices, but, but kind of um, integration points, right? And so it would allow for the ease of integration of any different type of uh, third party vendors systems, you know, into ours, right? And that means the edge devices, you know, really become SaaS based. Right. So we have SaaS in the cloud and then we have SaaS on the edge, right? Running uh, on those devices in containers. Um, and I think where, where I think it'll be a very interesting place for us to go, you know, is a place where, you know, those edge devices, you know, as well as cloud, right, can actually run apps that could be built by customers and or third parties almost in that Athena app store, right, where, um, you know, there can be the, the offering of um, small widgets that are running in those containers, right, on those edge devices. Um, you know, and, and that goes to where we would need to go through certification, off, offer certification, right, that they'll be guaranteed to run on, you know, the devices and, and, and in the containers that we would be, you know, deploying out to the edge. Um, so that's a very interesting space as well, I think, for us. Yeah, it is interesting. And it, it kind of sounds like you're taking what is this mainstream appeal of the chat GPT and, and other AI models and bringing it into this wonky world of ours where you're saying, I know you've seen all of that you know, in your day to day or on the news or whatever, now you can do it with a, a battery as well like that. I think that's kind of a, an interesting appeal and crossover event there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it it um, you know, it, it, it turns what is a very complex system into something which is much more um, interactive in a whole new level. Right. And so, um, you know, being able to basically interrogate and have a conversation with your infrastructure is is a pretty interesting, you know, pretty interesting space. Have to you be talked in, right? to batteries before, Albert? <laughs> I'm sure you've tested well, it out. Quite, yeah, I won't go quite that far, but um, but uh, we're right on the edge of that, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think, um, you know, we're, we're also enabling interfaces which will allow for 
um, you know, the application to operate, you know, um, just by asking questions to interrogate it for data, you know, for charting and other types of, uh, of, um, and even, even, you know, output based, right. So me, show me how I might, you know, um, improve the output of my, um, battery infrastructure based on, you know, inverter configurations, right. Mm -hmm. Or if, um, if, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, request, um, scenarios of um, different types of solar farm sizing or other, right? Getting into this this space where you can get results um, in a much a shorter duration just by interfacing these types of of you know chat interfaces with your system. Or this OEM versus this OEM, and how would yeah. that work with my system? Interesting. Yep. Well, that's a good segue too to this this next question, and maybe pulling off your STEM hat just a bit because you're a you're a CTO, so I imagine you watch what others are doing and at least have a general curiosity about where the broader momentum is. Um, what do you think are the most exciting applications of this kind of technology for maybe the broader uh, clean energy space, but just in general? Um, I think when you're talking about language bots, you know, I think about the development process and inter interconnection agreements and siting contracts and, um, you know, mm -hmm. the, the very manual pieces of deploying clean energy beyond just the optimization, which I, I can understand. You know, you have yeah. vast amounts of data and you're trying to respond to market signals and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it makes me think back to a conversation I had with the CEO of TerraBase, Matt Campbell, about this big picture idea of solar development with a click of a button. You know, you you say, I want to build this solar project, find me the location, you use mm -hmm. GIS AI, you then automate yeah. the solar construction using autonomous vehicles. And I mean, it seems like that's where everything may ultimately be going, but curious to, to hear what you think. So I, um, I mean, I, I think in, in, you know, a state where, you know, we have that type of, um, you know, kind of robotic, uh, advancement, right? Then, then absolutely, hallelujah. Like I'm, you know, I'm a believer. I think um, there is just like with everything, right? There's that that you know transition period. And mm -hmm. so, how do you how do you, outside of that kind of nirvana, right? How do you um, how do you make sure that you have something which is going to um, step us through the process? And so, this is where I do think that um, you know the integration, you know, of of all of the different links. In the, in the supply chain of what a project is, you know, does need to be brought together in what is, um, you know, a, basically a form of a, of a marketplace, um, you know, or, or an integration portal, you know. And so um, when you think about, you know, the contracts and the terms and conditions and all the different scenarios, the local zoning issues, right, there's a myriad of, of red tape around all of this, you know. And so, and, or to your point, like the, the interconnection interconnection agreements and even the the timeline for all of that, the entire supply chain, right, in terms of what it takes and when you're going to order um, the configurations, uh, rival, who's involved, et cetera. That whole process, you know, I think is a great opportunity for, um, you know, as an in, in a transitional period, you know, integrating into a marketplace environment. And then, you know, usually the first step in, in, in integration of third parties like this, right, you know, is, um, you know, is basically the, you know, the, uh, what is a configurator of legal terms and conditions, right? And this is where I think it's, it's very interesting. I've, I've, I've done projects like this in the past where, you know, you're integrating what is the equivalent of SOWs, MSAs, legal contracts of a whole, you know, kind of variety of types of procurement agreements, um, you know, hardware configuration, software configuration. And you're looking at this, this massive array of variables and how you match all of this up, right, based on the timing and your objectives and really what you want as outputs, right? So I think that, um, you know, there's a very, uh, a very manageable, very real world um, state where, um, where the evolution of this in, in the type of integration hub or marketplace or whatnot, you know, is, um, is, is a huge opportunity. Um, so I think that is a place where AI and, and, you know, pattern matching and the matching of all these kind of variables, you know, is front and center. Um, and, and we've had, you know, conversations about this as well. And there's certain sizes and shapes of those projects, right? So, um, you know, if you're dealing with, you know, small, medium sized projects, um, large projects are going to be potentially an undertaking, which will be, 
um, you know, too, too probably unique in, in various ways that they may want, you know, kind of some specific one-offs or, or negotiate certain things, right? But I think for um, many of these other projects, I think it's a huge opportunity and it gets us to a point, you know, pre-Nirvana, right, which actually will really accelerate the deployment of this type of infrastructure as we kind of look at, at the different places. And like you said, sort of looking at GIS data and, um, and like I said, we have, we have packages which, which will analyze and come up with what the models would be and the results would be for you know deployment of infrastructure in, in various kind of locations etc so uh, we're not too far off from something which is i think a good intermediary point that would bring that to um a, a near to midterm reality i feel like this space specifically is so ripe for partnerships where you have this rich data on the, the storage side you obviously made an acquisition on the solar side, which they, they marry together so so well. Um, I mentioned Terabase, they're partnering with Transec to integrate not only the, you know, the asset monitoring, but with the env environmental permitting piece and using software to kind of bring all that together. Are there further opportunities that STEM can, you know, spread its wings and get into some other areas where a partnership makes sense or an ac another acquisition makes sense? Does anything kind of kick around in, in your brain? Um, you know, whether it's part of that development life cycle, or I think of other companies with tons of data and Arcadia that can, you know, really utilize all this utility data that we have at the resi and, and you know, community yeah. solar level. Where Where's the opportunity yeah. there? Well, um, I mean, that's, yeah, those are, uh, you know, Forward looking very, statements. For, for, yeah, forward looking. Yeah. So I, I won't go too far. <laughs> I always far try to that, work but, those but in we're... once or twice to see if I can catch I, exactly. I can't imagine. I, I can't imagine <laughs> that. But uh, I mean, STEM is an organization which is, um, you know, I think uh, has a very, you know, kind of well funded base, right? And so, um, you know, we're always looking at these opportunities. We have a relatively, um, you know, col colorful and rich um, kind of, um, you know, acquisition and, or an MA kind of. Um, uh, team, et cetera. Um, you know, the also energy acquisition was was um, pretty large and substantial. And so I think that we're always looking at, at opportunities and, you know, um, you know, we review them on a regular basis. There have been some very interesting ones which would, um, you know, kind of get us into a space, you know, that's kind of like that. But, um, uh, you know, some are software, some are, you know, hardware, but um, I don't want to go too far in, into into those kinds of things at this point. Yeah, no, I but don't there, blame you. There, there's probably there's trouble. opportunities there. Yeah, yeah. I've I've, I've yeah, had so. an episode or two have to be put on the shelf because of SEC concerns. Don't worry, there we've got a vault yeah, yeah. Uh, of that content, so maybe one day I'll be able to release it. Um, okay, so this is the kind of question that I wait until we're 35 minutes into the episode, so that my my boss is probably tuned out. Um, where's the bullshit here? You know, what do you see as being mm. a lot of hot air around AI and machine learning? Yeah. What what can listeners yeah. take from this to say, you know, I'm having a hard time deciphering what's real and what's not? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a nice, juicy real world question. And it's it's warranted, you know. And so I think, um, you know, these days you see AI is in everything. I mean, it's you know, you go to a, a hot dog vendor on the street, you know, and, and, and their carts, you know, sometimes they're putting, you know, just kind of jovial stickers on AI powered, um, you know, and so I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of hype in all of this. And, you know, what sometimes are um, basic correlations um, and relatively simple analytics, right, you're finding that people are just blowing this stuff out of the water and, hmm. and calling it AI. And, and, you know, it's the next thing from, you know, you know, the next moon launch and, and so on and so forth. It's like, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, very much, you know, kind of abused. And so I think that folks just like vertically integrated know, developers who say they're uh, EPC asset owner, IPP, all of that, that that bugs me too. <laughs> but this is starting to take first place and what bugs me. Yeah, this, this, yeah, this does take and it's, it's, you know, it went from, you know, it went from, uh, you know, business intelligence, you know, to data analytics, to, you know, data science, to machine learning, to deep learning, to then AI, you know, and so, you know, these kinds of terms over the years have just, you know, continually been abused. And, you know, each time that they factor something in, it's usually, uh, you know, like two stages 
uh, you know, in, in kind of a lower tier of where they actually are versus, you know, what's actually the hype. And so, um, you know, what's exciting about, I think, you know, us is that we've been doing, you know, this from the beginning. So, you know, for me to say like, oh, you know, um, you know, do we have something which, you know, we'll just, uh, you know, configure your environment and and tell you exactly the most idealistic trades to make on the planet and, and it will, you know, so it's, you know, we're not there, but what we are what we are building is i think you know cutting edge and we're an organization that's been founded in data science and analytics machine learning um you know it's just it's just like in in the early days of my career we were you know working on um kind of these pioneering and defining engagements where it was you know apps on tap right and and then that turned into then cloud and then that turned into SaaS and so on you know and so um you know there's always kind of these various hype cycles um, but I do think that that now everyone is throwing AI into just about, you know, every, you know, marketing message. And so it can get overhyped. Um, what I feel great about and what we do is that it's based on kind of authentic, um, you know, data history and um, machine learning and the optimizations that we've been doing, right, as our core offering. So we don't build battery systems. We don't build solar systems. We build, you know, optimization engines, right? And that's all around, you know, data science, machine learning. And so it's uh, it's exciting space for us. Is there a single red flag that like when you're reading about a company or you see a name pop up, this is the way that you know if they're legit or not? Is there is there one thing that sticks out? Um, well, I will say that I um, that I'll look at, um, you know, what they've what they've claimed historically. Right. And so um, you can do something and look across it for uh you know you know six months 18 months 24 months and just you know look for some level of connective tissue in the statements that they're making right and so quite often you'll see organizations that are you know popping up um you know with these amazing offerings but there's no history there right and innovation you know can do that and you can you can spawn things you know with with prototypes etc you know but um but i will look for some consistency Right in the historical claims of what you know products and what kind of services uh, capabilities had been um, you know kind of previously launched, et cetera, and that gives a level of validation and authenticity when you see that kind of connective tissue over the years. What excites you most about what you're working on today at STEM? What you see happening in the space and and what it means for this industry, which I know has its share of headwinds and challenges when it comes to deploying these assets. We know we have to get quicker. Mm. We know we need to yeah. uh, improve performance, which is a wholly other issue that I talk about a lot on this show. Um, what what keeps you going? Well, I, I think for us, um, it's just the, the rate of growth, acceleration, passion, right, in the new renewable space. Right? I mean, it's everywhere around us. Um, you know, I can look around and see the number of people who have um, who have gotten rid of even recently acquired cars, you know, and gone, you know, to switch to EV, right? Because they're enthusiasts, they're passionate about, you know, renewables, um, you know, organizations that they want to come up with, you know, ways of getting involved more on their own. Like I was mentioning earlier, customers that really want to um, even spin up their own infrastructure and how can it be, how can we provide the software that runs it? And, and there's just a, a massive amount of interest um, across the board from, you know, residential to, you know, consumer, um, you know, home size systems, um, you know, to then industrial, commercial and all that, right? So um, the rate of change is phenomenal. Even when you see car manufacturers make their claims, um, fleet manufacturers, when we see, um, you know, requests that are coming from all sorts of different um, third parties, the F500, you know, there's just an enormous amount of interest. And so um, for us, you know, software is fantastic. You can you can build it at a relatively rapid rate. You know the um, you know the challenges you know for uh, interconnect agreements and deployment of projects out into the field, right? Coming up with with ways that we can support that, you know, in a in a more almost DIY manner, you know, would be exciting, right? So I'm thinking about you know best of class services that you know are fantastic for the F500, and then coming up with DIY you know models for small you know, medium-sized businesses. Um, but the uh, the way that we can, um, you know, leverage software to empower what is a massive change in, in the industry right now is, is what excites me. Um, as well as I think, 
um, you know, our the complexity of our systems, right? Of 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 building these cloud-based SaaS services, you know, as well as the edge, right? I love the edge and IoT kind of space, right? It's very exciting, and maintaining, you know, reliability and and um, the diagnostic, the instrumentation, right? The, um, you know, the predictive characteristics of how we can, you know, present the most reliable infrastructure for customers. Like that's that's super exciting to me. Albert Holfeld, thanks so much for joining the fact of this podcast. John, appreciate you having me. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Albert Hofelt for joining the podcast. Factor This is a production of Renewable Energy World and Clarion Energy. Join us every Monday as we break down solar's biggest stories with industry leaders who actually move the needle. And please leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Factor This from Renewable Energy World.